Hi, I'm Holly Sexton Foy with HCEC TV and Abound Credit Union. FYI, some fun facts about the partnership between Abound Credit Union and HCEC TV is that we provide financial education free of charge, no cost to students in elementary, middle, and high school. So if you have a student that attends Hardin County Schools or you are a student who attends Hardin County Schools, you will at some point come in contact with Abound Credit Union through our financial education program because we want you to be responsible and empowered when it comes to your money when you get out in the real world. Today on Issues and Insights, I'm happy to welcome Mike McNutt. Mike is the Animal Care and Control Director and he has a lot of exciting things to share with us, to give us an update on what's going on with animal care and control in Hardin County government, but also about a partnership with Lou Adopts in Louisville. So we'll get started at the beginning. For those who aren't familiar with you, Mike, um, tell us a little bit about your background and your passion for animals and how that impacted the trajectory of your career. Well, I, I started out in Louisville um, at the Kentucky Humane Society, April 1st, 1989. I was 19 years old, hadn't found what I was looking for until I walked into that shelter. I actually volunteered every day off the first year uh, because it was, it was everything to me. That's huge. Yeah, and, and I, I, it was overwhelming. I was that guy that went out and tried to stop hunters and stuff in the beginning. And you know, the more mature I got, I wanna make sure I'm clear on this, <laughs> Uh, hunters, I uh, appreciate the hunters and the hunters need to do their job. Yeah. I, I mean, they're necessary and needed. Uh, under, yes, a hundred percent. And I understand it now, but when you're young and, and you know, everything's you're new passionate. You. Yeah, yeah. You know, it, it's, that's, that's what it was like for me there. But I spent 27 years there. Um, and that's, this is my second job. You know, uh, I was coming up here and we were taking dogs from the shelter and taking them up to Louisville and, uh, and adopting them out. Um, I had been friends with Jerry Foley for 30 years. We both actually started right around the same time. So I'd known him and we had known each other, you know, for years and I was aware of his shelter. Um, and, and he was the, Jerry was, was the, the former, former director. director. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And so when I was coming down getting animals, Joellen Thomas, who was the president of Focus, Friends of Hardin County Animal Shelter, she was who I would work with on picking out animals. and. I uh, always tried to explain to the people I were training on how to do this that you you cannot always pick the diamonds. You have to take a chunk of coal every once in a while. Mm -hmm. Joellen would help me pick that proper chunk of coal. You know, there's always a dog that's just walked by and, and missed over and over again for no reason. And it's got wonderful personality. And yeah, it may not be the, the prettiest dog in the world. But or the designer dog exactly. or, or full bred, yeah. But the per personality is wonderful. So when she found out Jerry was going to, to Louisville, she um, asked me to apply, and I told her I would. I had no interest in leaving KHS, I really didn't, but if I tell you I'm gonna do something, I'll do it. And so it went along, I came down again next week, and the deputy judge was there to meet me, Jim Roberts, and he like, started talking to me, and he said, you've got all kinds of certifications and everything, we're really interested, and I was like, oh, okay. And then the next time, Harry Berry was waiting for me. That's so, a good sign. Uh, yeah, but, and I told my wife, I was like, they're taking me really serious. And she's like, well, have you thought about it? And I'm like, it's an hour away. You know, mm -hmm. we live in Louisville. I said, it's an hour away. I said, I, I don't know. But anyway, I believe everything happens for a reason. And uh, I ran into a man at a store one day, and he was an elderly gentleman. And he had his arm in a sling and had a boot on one of his feet. And he tried to open the door for me, and I tried to open the door for him. And we stood there looking at each other and he trying to get one of us to walk through the door. And finally I looked at him and I said, sir, my grandma's up in heaven and if I don't hold this door for you, she's gonna beat me when I get up there. <laughs> and he said, well, son, I can't have your grandma mad at you. And he walked through the door and it was like a light bulb went off that this is where I belonged. This community is where I belonged. Mm -hmm. So that's how all that came to be. I, I'd already seen a staff of hardworking, dedicated people there. Uh, and I will say that they are the success of that shelter. They're incredible, every single one of them. Mm -hmm. um, they're, they're my family. I mean, they are. They're, the stuff we do there is incredible. And talk about passionate. They are too. Oh, they really yeah. care. And you can't work there long term and not really care about the health and welfare of yeah. the animals. And people don't get that. People, I don't think they understand that, you know, all the time we get this, oh, I can never work there, I love animals too much, and people don't get that that's, that's an insult. You're, you're, mm -hmm. you're insulting us, because what I'll tell you is, I'm sorry, the people that love the animals the most, 
dedicate their lives to us to it. That's what we do. To doing the hard stuff. Yeah, yeah. That's that's who really loves the animals. The ones that are there every day and that can afford to work for the wages. That you know, that's another thing. I, I'm fortunate that I have a wife that's willing to have a, a job and to make sure that I'm capable of doing this job, you know, financially. You're not going to get rich doing this job. Mm -hmm. At least not monetarily. Spiritually, I would say you're richer than almost anybody walking the earth, but that's just me. <laughs> That's because all dogs go to heaven, right? Yeah, there you go. <laughs> well, let's talk about that because policies and procedures um, are really important for managing animal care and control, but also um, taking the program to where it is now and growing it. So it is a place that is about the welfare of the animal, mm -hmm. right? It's not a sad place. It is a place where adoptions happen. It is a place where um, animals go and um, they maybe it's a, a stop through where they're on their way to some place better. Right. And, and, and you're the depot where they go through. Well, and if you know, if we're gonna if we're gonna talk about policies and procedures, you know, we now know that we were doing sheltering wrong for the past thirty years. It was like somebody slapping me in the face when I figured that out. That cats don't belong in shelters. You know, they don't. Whether you're the cleanest shelter in the world or not, stress will cause sicknesses that are inside the cat to come out within inside three days. We're not mandated to handle cats. The county's not. The state is not. The state has no laws for us to take cats. The county has no laws for us to take cats. Mm -hmm. okay, the cat problem has been here since, the, since Americans have been Americans. Mm -hmm. So it's always been a problem. You know, cats reproduce so quickly, that's the issue. And when you take away their natural predators out there, that's when the population gets overdone. So one of the first things that we started was the uh, trap neuter return program. I had to get funding for it uh, to get it to to meet the criteria for what I approached the the county officials with. They weren't real keen on the idea of us putting these cats back out there. They didn't understand that that while we were euthanizing at that time 1,500 cats a year at the cost of $25 per cat to the taxpayer, mm -hmm. the numbers were going up because of something known as the vacuum effect. And please don't believe me, look this up yourself, always. Don't ever just take it for granted, do your own research. Problem is with YouTube and everything being the way it is, you can find research that has no science backing to say whatever, but the vacuum effect takes place. If you, we've had farmers that we started this program with that would come see us every year, bring us 10, 12 cats every year. So we started the program, we did all of his cats. Next year he came in, he had half the amount of cats, maybe six. Third year we didn't see him. So we <laughs> eventually sent an officer out there, just go find out what's going on. We're, you know, this man's always here. He used to come get cat food from us. We haven't seen him forever. Our guy goes out there and he's like, no man's like, no, it worked, it, it's working. There, I don't have any cats to bring you this year. I've still got you know, four of the ones that we originally done. and That he needed, right, and, for pest control, mm -hmm. yeah. And cats will fight off their territory mm -hmm. and uh, you know a male will welcome in a female if he's intact and that's how the cat population gets big mm -hmm. and you, if you're talking about a species that can recreate every three to four months have a litter of eight and then those can start reproducing in three or four months you do the math yourself you know we started this in September 2018 is when we started the return to field program we've done a grand total of 2,551 return to field surgeries now, if you look at all those and multiply that, those numbers by eight for every three months, you know, we're, we're putting a big dent in it and we're seeing less and less come in. Mm -hmm. We do, I'll explain how we do that in, in a minute, um, but this is, the d numbers 2,551 are up to, through April of 2023. Um, and it's also a positive outcome. Now, when we first started it, we went with Target Zero. They gave us the funding for it, and we had to return everything back to the field. I had people coming to me all the time complaining, well, you know, you're, it's great, you're cutting down the pop, you know, what's going to be produced, but the cats are coming back. So when we were able to make it our own program, I said, all right, we're going to try and rehab the ones we can rehab. Mm -hmm. So we started doing that. If they'll use a litter box, and that's where the program works now. If we can get them into a home, that's what we do. People still aren't happy with that. Mm -hmm. They want their outside cats back. So it's, 
you know, we never can keep push everybody. It's that push-pull, yeah. Um, I noticed there were several in my neighborhood, in my former neighborhood, with the docked mm -hmm. ear, and they did a great job with pest control, mm -hmm. and they were territorial, right? Mm -hmm. But they never, um, they didn't bother us, and we didn't bother them, and they were the neighborhood cats. Well, and, and, and there were there were three, I think, in our entire neighborhood. And if most people give us a chance, and don't just automatically, America's all about the quick fix, mm -hmm. They, you know, but yet you don't go down to the road department and take a pothole in and go, hey, I need you to fix this and expect them to do it at the time of day. We're Hardin County government too, so we need time to work and we need to work it in a way that saves lives, not does the opposite. Yeah. Um, there are deterrents you can use. You know, I had a guy that he had this, just brought a new truck and he was so upset and I said, I've got these ultrasonic solar powered deterrents that I'm gonna rent you at no cost, mind you, you can set them up, and if they keep the cats off your truck, then you can decide to go ahead and buy your own. Mm -hmm. So, and I told him a couple other things, like they don't like citrus smells, so I'll put citrus in a water thing and I'll spray the areas that I don't want them to come to in my neighborhood up in Louisville. Yeah. Because Louisville has a return to field. Every body that's doing it right has a return to field program. Mm -hmm. And like you said, it takes time, right? Yes. So a couple of things, you're saving lives, you're, mm -hmm. you're euthanizing less. Oh yes. Right? It, and then on top of that, you're saving money, you're oh, saving yeah. the county money, and then um, the heartbreak, right? For mm -hmm. those who, um, when you hear no kill, or you know, that, that phrase used, what does that mean exactly? Um, you're still, you still have a cat room and you still have um, adoptions available for cats. Right, well, for and cats. like right now, we're doing everything we can to get adoptable cats. Mm -hmm. That's a beautiful problem to have compared to having to stand and euthanize 10 and 20 a day, you know, and that we will not be going back to those days, at least not while I'm there. Yeah. If that's the direction we're going, I will, I'll mm -hmm. retire, I won't be able to do that. But um, we, we do our best to accommodate all the public, but with that being said, you know, we can't make everybody happy. I had a lady there was just mad as she could be yesterday and uh, had a, actually had Brian Walker. Mm -hmm. uh, he sent me a Facebook post where a lady was saying, some stuff in, um, on Facebook, and it was about the term no kill, and to some of it, she was, she was accurate. I hate the term no kill. It's mm -hmm. a horrible term because... It's kind of this blanket term, mm -hmm. and it's a little um, confusing, misleading, and, and mostly uninformed. Yeah, and we, I, I will never be able to work at a shelter that is 100% the, uh, the definition of no kill because I'm never gonna let an animal suffer. Mm -hmm. We're the ones in the middle of the night going out and picking up animals hit by car, uh, animals attacked by other animals. We've had gunshots. We've had animals shot with arrows. We've had some horrific humans are, are, are the biggest problem. So I will never work at a place where if they cannot be saved, they have to suffer. So mm -hmm. Just you know, to keep the no-kill status yes. is what you're saying. Well, is that, that what I hear no, you saying? No, I mean, for, for a, a shelter, uh, for a municipality, no-kill means pretty much means that you don't euthanize for time or space. I see, okay. So while that is 100% true with our shelter, we do not euthanize for time or space. We're also responsible for what we put out into the public. Mm -hmm. So if we get an animal in that is that I would not put in the backyard next to my grandchild, I'm not gonna put it next door to yours. Mm -hmm. That That's irresponsible. Yeah. So, and that's who we are, that's our job, is to, is to only put out quality animals as best we can. Now, of course, we can't guarantee what they're gonna be like. We, you know, we know now that an animal doesn't even acclimate till it's at home until it's six or eight months in. Mm -hmm. And at that point, if there's another dog there, it's gonna challenge it for the alpha spot. And then there are people, you see this got along with other dogs. We had it for eight days. It takes, yeah, it, it takes It got along time. with the dogs there, and it was a neutral territory, and a lot of people don't get that. A lot of people don't understand that we take what the, the, the client that brought the animal into us, if it's an owner, mm -hmm. we take that information and we apply it, but we only go by what we see there. You know, is it house broke? It is here. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean it's gonna be in your home. A lot of people don't get that. A lot of people don't understand that after animals are together for a while, there's gonna be a fight sometime. I mean, my dogs, they've been together forever, but they fight over a particular ball or a bone or something, they have arguments, just like me and my wife have arguments, you know, they're mm -hmm. family members, so. That nature part is really strong. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and you know, the fact where I was talking about we were doing it wrong, um, 
we're mandated, animal controls, municipalities are mandated to handle roaming dogs mm -hmm. and livestock in the roadways. There's nothing about cats. There's nothing about me taking your dog. Mm -hmm. I do not have to accept Holly Sexton's dog. Mm -hmm. We do that as a courtesy by appointment. So what that means is I'll make an appointment for you. But if I've got to euthanize to make a spot for your dog to come in, I'm going to call you and say, hey, sorry, you're going to have to call one of the other rescues. Yeah. People really get mad at us for that. But once you take responsibility for a dog, it, you're, you know, it's your responsibility. Mm -hmm. We're not mandated to take owners. We don't have to do that. Well, um, and I know you accommodate and your team tries to accommodate as much as you can. Um, how can a viewer watching get more information about being a um, smarter adopter? Do your research always on your breeds. You know, I would say that's one of the biggest reasons that we exist is because people don't understand even mixed breeds have certain characteristics that, that come from the original breeds that they are. Just for instance, the one that always fascinates me is, you know, Dotsons, wiener dogs. Mm -hmm. They are bred to go into a badger's house and take him out of it. When you just sit and you realize that a badger is one of the most fiercest creatures on the earth and this dog, this little 12, 15 pound dog goes into his home yeah. and takes him out. Yeah. And Moxie, fearlessness. <laughs> stubbornness, hard headedness, uh, yeah. you know, I mean, do your research and understand what they were bred for mm -hmm. before you get them. And if you have the space for that, you have the time, you have the energy, all of those things oh, to come yes. together and before adopting. And, you know, there adopting. are people that, that think that, oh, uh, a man can't have a Great Dane in an apartment. Not true. Mm -hmm. Not true. Is it hard? Oh, yeah. It's hard. That tail's going to clean coffee tables and do all <laughs> kinds of stuff like that. But, yeah. say, if the man is a, a jogger or an avid walker, that's all it takes. Yeah. You know, that's all it takes. My dogs get walked. They have a small backyard to run around in, but me and my wife, we, we walk the dogs, we exercise the dogs. You know, just do your best to be a pro. And another thing, you know, while we're talking about policy and procedures, we never want somebody in the public to pick up a stray. Mm -hmm. I know that's hard for people to hear, hard for people to understand. Because they but, feel like they're helping. And, and I get that. But what we want you to do is to call us. You know, that is what we do. Mm -hmm. um, we do stray pickups Monday through Friday, 8 to 4 p.m. There are a lot of people that get upset about Saturdays and Sundays. Statistically, for and we've done this research, for this type of community, mm -hmm. these type of industries, these type of businesses, animal controls that do not pick up strays on Saturdays and Sundays have higher pet retention. Proven fact, not Mike's rules, it's proven fact. Those animals will go back home, okay? Now, I know a lot of people have trouble with that, but I never want somebody to put a, pick up a dog and put it in a car with them. That would be so irresponsible for me to say, yeah, bring me a stray. That's, they're never going to hear that. Mm -hmm. So do we want to take strays at the back door? We do not. We would rather go pick them up ourselves. That's what we're there for. Of course, what people don't like, we have three officers and 600 miles of roadway. Mm -hmm. You know, when there's a stray in West Point, it does take me, take my guys a few minutes to get there because they better not speed. I mean, uh, they better not. They will, hear, uh, they will hear it from me if I find out that they're speeding. To be, res be responsible, but to the credit of your team and to the positive, Saturday is a big adoption day mm -hmm. every week. Yes. Yeah, mm -hmm. and so um, for those who want to help, if, if they're not picking up animals, what are some things that they can do to be helpful? Can they donate things? Can, what what well, can they, they do? They can donate things, but I'd say the number one thing is be a responsible pet owner and let us do our job. Mm -hmm. Please let us do our job. I think people believe that we want their animals. We do not want your animals. <laughs> we do not want yeah. your animals. That, say, that does nothing for anybody. That it's not physically responsible. That's not emotionally responsible in no way. We want your animals to be with you. So when my guys go out to a stray, they scan it. They check the neck, neck band, see if there's any, if they have a way of getting that dog back to its owner in the field, that's what we do. That happens every day with us. When people bring them to the back door, the first thing we're gonna say is, of course, are you a Hardin County resident? We only accept animals from Hardin County residents without an approval from us because we are so high in our programs 
that I had to turn a lady back the other day from Horse Cape, Kentucky, wanted her animals with us because we're no kill, which is a horrible term. Mm -hmm. um, and But you do have a good reputation, so it sounded like, and I've heard this from people from other counties, right. they do want to bring their animals there because they feel more confident mm -hmm. in their welfare and what's going to happen and, to them. But that, I, that is not my responsibility. My responsibility is to Hardin County and its residents. We enforce Hardin County ordinances. We don't enforce city ordinances. You know, we use them, we educate people on them, but that's really not our job to enforce them either. Um, but we, we want to be part of the community and we want to be the saviors of the animals, but we want to keep animals in homes, not in the shelter. That doesn't solve anything for anybody. Mm -hmm. You know, right now we, um, we do surgeries Monday through Friday spay and neuter surgeries, be it return to field, but we also have partnerships with uh, different area, Bullitt County, Meade County, Grayson County. We're helping them with their surgeries. Uh, that's the type of stuff we wanna do. You know, spay and neuter is the key to everything. You know, yeah. um, you know we, we also, we have an open adoption policy. So when you come up, if, you're, if you haven't been charged with cruelty or anything like that, we're gonna adopt to you. Now there's a lot of people like, well, you know that guy, he's, he's this, he's that, whatever. Well, I don't know that, but what I do know is if a person wants an animal, they're gonna get it. Mm -hmm. And if I can pop, put one in their hands that are spayed or neutered and they're not responsible pet owners, at least I'll be the one getting that dog back and it won't be reproducing in this county. I see, So okay. a lot of people don't like that, but that's best practices. Mm -hmm. You know, there's, there's a lot of that, that, that stuff going on that people don't understand but we've got to continue to move forward and to get better. And I'm fortunate uh, to have Hardin County government backing me because we get training. And you know, right now I'm, I'm the uh, president of the Kentucky Animal Care and Control Association. So me and my board members are in charge of all the training for all the officers in 120 counties. If I'm not able to go to these trainings, these big national trainings, I don't have any new programs to bring to them. So I'm fortunate that I work for a county that uh, helps me educate myself to better not only Hardin County, but at this point, the state. And overall, I mean, that makes uh, sense for the the people who are employed mm -hmm. in those fields, but also for the animals, right? And yes. then we know that that can lead to uh, improved laws. Mm -hmm to help animals. Um, before we go, I want to make sure and cover Lou Adopts and this new okay. partnership in Louisville. Well, right now, we know that statistically across the nation, shelters are taking in 4% more animals than they're putting out. That number's staggering when you sit and think about, we're talking about a national number, and some shelters, depending on their size, may be responsible for a higher percentage than so right now, shelters have to think outside the box. We are gonna be partnering with uh, Kentucky Humane Society and Louisville Metro Animal Control, and there's gonna be seven different total organizations. Um, it's gonna be called Lou Adopts. It's May 13th, it's from 12 to four. It's free, and it's sponsored by Isaacs and Isaacs the Hammer, mm -hmm. and he will be there. So- um, he's, a, he's a celebrity. <laughs> well. <laughs> I guess with his billboards and things like that. For me, yeah. he he is because I met him years ago at Kentucky Humane Society because he's always helped animal organizations. So he's he he's more to me than I think what other people may see. Yeah. He, he's he's in the battle with me, so. Uh, he's an ally. Yeah, he's somebody I, yeah. I, I look up to. And now to my son, my 13 year old son, he's the guy on the billboard. Yes. So he's a celebrity. He's the hammer. Yeah. He's the hammer, that's so, right, yeah. Uh, but this event's hosted by the Kentucky Humane Society and Louisville Metro Animal Control. Uh, what we're hoping to do is adopt out over 100 dogs that day in that short period of time. There'll be different adoption fees for different groups depending on who they are. You know, um, I don't think people understand like a $90 adoption fee. They, they, some people think that's high. Call and price what a, a spay or neuter surgery is right now and then call yeah. me back and tell me if you think it's high because it's not. Mm -hmm. um, that's just what, you know, every animal has value. And what we find, you know, when, we, when you do free adoptions is you get so many turned back in because people like the thought of getting a free animal, but they don't understand it's, it's a responsibility. So the small fee that is charged covers a lot, but also um, kind of uh, separates the responsible owners from maybe those who aren't ready well, yeah, for, when, for when, an animal yet. When we were open, when I first got there, they would accept animals at the back door from eight to four. 
and they would adopt out animals from 12 to 4. When you think of a parking lot, and if you're taking animals in and you know, taking cars in and whatever, that's not, then you're going to be over full soon. So, and, you know, we take animals in and the schedule that we do because of cross-contamination, because we're doing outside surgeries. I would have to stop outside surgeries if we started taking animals at 8 o'clock in the morning. Yeah. Um, and it's not best practice. And we're not going to do anything that's not best practice. We're going to try and save lives and we're going to try and be the best animal shelter in the state as much as we can. Well, I know you're very passionate about it. And um, Lou Adopts, how can people um, find out more information about that? Um, it's, you know, it's going to be advertised, but of course they can go to uh, our Facebook page, go to Kentucky Humane Society's Facebook page, go to Louisville Metro Animal Controls page. Um, it, you know, they could just, if they Google Lou Adopts, I'm sure they'll be able to find something out there on it now. And, and if, if, if somebody's not wanting to adopt right now, or is the, they're not in the market, so mm -hmm. to speak, just sharing it yes. on social media yeah, can every, be really helpful. Yeah, that's very helpful. That's very helpful. And, um, you know, I think a lot of people don't understand that we accept donations at the shelter as well, of, of fi not only financial, but cleaning supplies. We have a list up on our Facebook page. Uh, a lot of that information is there, but if not, just call and ask. Uh, we'll be more than glad to give that information to any, anybody. And, um, you know, the staff there, they love what they do, but they get frustrated too. Yeah. Um, we had a very hard day yesterday. Um, and it was, I remember turning to what me and the deputy director do, we, we walk to the mailbox. Mm -hmm. It's pretty much from 7.30 till 4, the only time that I go outside, really. So uh, we walk to the mailbox and we... It was, we were so stressed, we went to walk yesterday, and she goes, so let me get this right. Were me and you the only ones in that room that wasn't crying? I was like, yeah. Yeah. But that's part because we're, we're not front line. We're not in, we're, we're the ones in the offices, so we don't get attached to some of this. You know, when I was leaving today, we had an animal hit by car. Now, my veterinarian, Dr. Scott McIntyre, who is the most talented veterinarian I've ever I got to meet him with. the other night. Very he, friendly. He's a hoot, and he's so knowledgeable, and, and we've been able to save so many animals that we wouldn't have been able to save with him there. So we're blessed to have him. I'm blessed to have the staff. I'm, I'm blessed to be part of Hardin County government and the community. Mm -hmm. So um, as far as directors go, I'm the happiest one I know. So Well, thank you for your example and how you're, you still can... Um, I have this passion for animals after all this time and all these years and, um, and to your staff as well. Thank you for what you're doing. Thank you. And thank you for watching Issues and Insights on HCEC-TV.